Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our RimWorld adventure in the tropical rainforest with the Believers of Boyo. Now, before we get started here today, I just want to briefly mention that I feel like I'm coming down with something, so the episode might just be a little bit shorter than usual, but we'll see how things go as we progress further through the video. Now, last time we left off after an episode that saw two people join our small colony of Red Chapel. First, we turned prisoner Tiffy into a slave, although I personally prefer the term repenter. And we also rescued Maniac, former colonist in the Cult of Jinx. In today's episode, we will make decisions on what to do with both of them. First of all though, we are following a highly popular suggestion from the comments of the last episode, as we are now renaming Elephant Rotona into Countess Rotona. I think that just fits a little bit better considering her elephant partner is the Earl of Bronze, so thank you everyone for suggesting that change. In addition to that, we also have to select our next research project now. And while I think that microelectronics are very much near the top of the list, let us quickly get both battery and air conditioning out of the way first. Both of them I think are just too useful, and they won't take that long to complete. Finally then, another choice that I asked for your input on, and once again you have spoken. And so the recipient of the honor reward for the hospitality for an aristocrat quest will be Brandon. After all, he's got a bit of a history with the Empire, and he is psychically sensitive, so he would make for a good psycaster. Our guest for the next 10 days then, Axouch, but there is no need to look at the stats here for too long. She will not be doing any work whatsoever, so even her jogger trade will mostly go unused. Her psychast's word of trust and water skip might be situationally useful though, and so might be her excellent quality plasma sword, although we do of course want to keep her alive so to not fail this quest. Just as we are rearranging some sculptures then to improve her meditation sci-focus bonus, we are already presented with the first event of today's episode, and it's not a good one as Tiffy here is trying to escape. And not only that, in her attempt to flee, she has also started to wail on Ellie, and I don't think the believers of Boyo know any mercy when it comes to harming our youngest, and so just as Tiffy equips an elephant tusk to arm herself, we are skipping her right in front of Wyatt to face her punishment. And as expected, one hit is all it takes until Tiffy goes down. On top of her already destroyed right eye, she now also loses a kidney. Ellie, meanwhile, thankfully only suffered a few cracks and bruises. And to be honest, considering that Tiffy is a delicate wimp, Ellie might have actually been able to win that fight. But I think it would be best not to take any chances. And so, while we are now patching Tiffy up, I think her time with us is about to come to an end soon. The whole idea behind enslaving her was to allow her to prove herself, and to me, attacking the colony's youngest child is not really a sign of repentance. So at this point, we are only waiting until she can walk again, and then I think it's time for Tiffy and the believers of Boyo to part ways. On the following morning then, we begin the construction of another set of bedrooms, as well as building one for Maniac, because yes indeed, we are going to keep him around. Not so much Tiffy though, who is now back up on her feet, and who will now leave us. Not through an execution, I don't think that would be the way of Boyo, but by simply casting her away. As you can see, she will also get to keep her clothing. Again, we do not necessarily want her to die, but after her actions there simply is no place in Red Chapel for her, and so we now lose what could have been a very useful colonist, but I guess she brought that unto herself. At this point then, as we send out both Took and Maniac to hunt, let's talk a bit about the reasons for keeping Maniac around. There were a few good comments on the last episode that kind of nailed what I had been thinking. Essentially it comes down to the fact that Maniac is 78 years old and has just been rescued from prison. So who would we be to deny him a safe place and perhaps a chance at redemption? Now the first step towards that redemption of course will be converting him. That is what Kevin is currently attempting to do, trying to persuade him to let go of his supremacist moral view ideology. And as you can see, Kevin is somewhat persuasive. Two more attempts like this and Maniac should see the way of Boyo. First of all though, we will send him out to prove his worth alongside a few other colonists in a small expedition to the psychic Drona. Protected by eight enemies, I think we might need a bit more than just Light and Wyatt for this one. And so we are sending out Light, Wyatt and Maniac. As usual, we will also give them three donkeys to speed up the journey, and we are also packing a thrombohorn here so that Maniac can switch from range to melee weapons. He is pretty good with both of them, and this allows us to remain flexible depending on what the situation requires. The small caravan then leaves our map in the early evening, although just a few hours later we might have reason for them to return back home, as we are presented with another charity quest. 
An Imperial shuttle is asking for an emergency landing at our colony, and of course we want to offer them our help, but that would also mean defending the shuttle from attackers, and unfortunately we only have 10 hours here until the quest expires. And so, since our caravan consists of our most capable fighters, let's immediately have them turn around and come back home, and then, just to give them as much time as possible, we are waiting until the very last moment to accept the quest. Once again, by the way, we will be going for the honor reward and we will do so with Brandon. Together with the hospitality quest, this will give him enough honor to achieve the rank of Yeoman, and as such, it will unlock psychic abilities for him. The shuttle then crashes just north of the ancient architect structure. Of its eight inhabitants, five are soldiers and therefore expandable, while the three civilians need to survive. And since we have no idea when the enemies will arrive, we will protect the shuttle with all that we have right from the beginning. Just in that moment, our small caravan also makes it back home, and so we have everyone who can fight, including our royal guests surrounding the shuttle, just as our enemies then finally make their appearance. Now we are fighting Itakin, a cult-resistant fairy people. They are capable of calling animals to help out in the fight, but with this group here carrying four triple rocket launchers, that might be the least of our concerns. The only upside here is that most of them are not really all that well armored, and luckily even the one who is goes down after just a few hits. At this point then, I think it would be a good idea to berserk pulse the enemies holding the triple rocket launchers. And actually, as long as they don't really seem to care about Light's presence, let's do it twice. But afterwards, I think it's high time to skip him back out of there. As you can see, the rest of our squad is standing a bit further in the back. After all, the Empire does have a few troops of their own to deal with this. And so our squad mainly concerns itself with singling out individual targets, who are then obviously no match for the combined power of seven colonists, three bears and two elephants. We do have a bit of a close call here though, as one of the triple rocket launcher wielders is getting very close to firing. Thankfully though, with another timely skip from Wyatt, we can prevent that. And so, just as Light skips himself back into safety, our colonists start targeting the rocket man, with expectable results, I guess. And there we are, that is thankfully all it takes. The shuttle has been successfully protected, and apart from Maniac, no one has taken any injuries. As you can see, we are also capable of taking at least one prisoner here, not to mention that our enemies dropped a fair amount of loot. The Imperial Rescue Shuttle, meanwhile, arrives in the evening, and so the quest is just about to be completed here. I think all but one of these soldiers actually survived the fight. And so here we are, quest completed. As a result, Brandon now receives the title of Freeholder, which doesn't really get him much, and we also earn three ideology development points, or rather just one, as we were already at nine and have a cap of ten. So to earn more, we have to reform our ideology. Now before we do that, let's take a quick look at our prisoner, a 16-year-old psychically dull night owl, who could very well become our second doctor and maybe fill a few other roles as well. As an Itakin, he also has the Animal War Call ability, so once every 15 days he can call upon an animal to fight at his side. Apart from that, Itakin make for great melee fighters with the aggressive strong melee damage and robust genes. However, they also take quite a while to recover from their wounds, not to mention that they actually have a reduced movement speed when clothed. So in terms of their combat utility, they are definitely a bit of a mixed bag. Still, we'll keep this one around as part of the Believers of Boyo Prisoner Protocol. And with all injuries patched up, we will also immediately begin converting him, which, as you can see, should not take that long. On the following day, then, we can see most of our Psycasters in deep meditation, and with good reason, as we want them to be well prepared for their second attempt to take out the Psychic Droner. So once again, we are sending out Light, Wyatt and Maniac together with three donkeys, and once again, it should only take them slightly more than one day to reach their destination. And while they now leave the map, we install some of the batteries that we have salvaged. Even with the actual technology not yet unlocked, we can still charge them up already, and who knows when that might come in handy. Our water mill, after all, is producing much more electricity than we currently need. At night then, while our caravan is on their way, we are informed that a combat supplier caravan is arriving. And so, after Kevin gets one step closer to finally converting our Itakin prisoner, we can do some trading. It is not the most exciting of trades though, but it still might be useful. We are selling some drugs as well as one of our two miniguns in exchange for a fresh new recon helmet. After all, investing in our pawn's protection is never a bad idea. Just in that moment, we are then also informed that Boomalope Krilly has given birth, 
And so, as our fourth boomalope, we now welcome Kuri to the colony of Red Chapel. His name, as always, chosen from the list of Patreon supporters in the naming rights tier and above. A few hours later then, Kevin is once again the center of attention, this time by unlocking batteries. And like I mentioned earlier, we will continue straight away with air conditioning, before we then focus on the slightly longer term microelectronics. Apart from a bit of harvesting and some more smoothing of floors and walls, not much more happens for the remainder of the day. And so we jump ahead to the evening, as Light, Wyatt and Maniac arrive at their destination. Our enemies seem to be inhabiting this structure by the mountain right here, which is also protected by a single turret, but other than that, there does not seem to be anything noteworthy about their defenses. So let's quickly switch Maniac back to the sniper rifle and then sneak up on our enemies through the caves here, as this makes it really easy to circumvent the turret's line of sight. Maniac then also immediately starts shooting the first enemy in range, and it only takes one more shot for them to go down, which now causes the rest of the enemies to begin fighting back. Now none of them carry anything terribly dangerous in terms of weaponry, and we can quickly get up to take down number two here thanks to Light Psychic Slug, at which point it is then time to retreat a bit further deeper into the cave. Our colonists should feel right at home in here, not to mention that it also allows us to take on the enemies in a much more controlled fashion. And so, enemies number 3 and 4 both go down quickly. As you can see, we can very easily take this fight one opponent at a time, which obviously minimizes the risks for everyone involved. Still, even after 5 enemies have been downed, our opponents do not stop fighting just yet, and since this one here is carrying a big heavy axe, we will stun them first before we engage, which is then also enough to send the remaining enemies fleeing. And so, while Maniac now uses the range of his sniper rifle to take out the turret entirely risk-free, Wyatt can crack open the door to the psychic droner and then start demolishing it too. With the turret taken out, Maniac then inspects our enemy's living quarters, and as you can see, they have been housing decently, at least they have left behind a plethora of meals, and I suspect that our cook Took will be very happy about that. Back in Rat Chapel, meanwhile, a shaman merchant arrives just before the psychic droner is destroyed, and with that now taken care of, a permanent minus 12 mood penalty for all females in the colony has also been removed, so let's reform our caravan and send them back home. And as you can see, we are taking with us quite the pile of loot, including some furniture, some lamps, chairs and a table, and also two more batteries. Arguably the biggest haul, however, that is in the food department. Simple meals, fine meals, survival meals, all of that comes with us now, and it will arrive back home pretty much instantly, as we are once again employing Light's Fast Skip Psycast to teleport home immediately. Now, the first thing that Maniac receives after returning home is another talking to from Kevin, and since the next one will most likely convert him, which would then earn us another ideology development point, it is time to now regain our ability to actually earn those, which means we now have to reform the Believers of Boyo. Now, normally I would ask you guys what you would like to see us do here, but this one has already been mentioned in the comments numerous times and I think it's an obvious choice. To add onto the guilty meme, our second meme for this ideology will be none other than Tunneler. I think this fits our current living situation quite well and it also brings about a few noticeable changes, such as a desire to eat fungus and insect meat. Now, another meme that has often been suggested already in the comments is the darkness meme, but just like female supremacy was in the Cult of Jinx, this is one that we can actually activate without spending a meme slot on it. I'll show you what I mean in just a second. For the time being, the Believers of Boyo gain three rather important new precepts. First, they have now gained a love for insect meat, which might become interesting to acquire. Second, as a faction of tunnelers, our mining yield has also been increased, albeit only by a meager 10%. And third, next to insect meat, our colonists have also acquired a taste for fungus, so much in fact that they will now receive mood penalties for eating food without fungus in it. As a fourth precept, they also no longer care about small spaces, but for the most part, that one will be hardly noticeable. What will become noticeable, however, is one of the two core precepts of the darkness meme. Our colonists now prefer to live in dark light and dark light only. The second precept of the darkness meme would be combat in darkness, but I think we are not quite at that point yet. Who knows though, maybe with the next reform. Now, despite our recent actions, slavery will remain disapproved. I think that also still fits the story quite nicely. Our colonists obviously don't want to take slaves, but they simply see no other way. 
Now the Tunnel Lamim also unlocks our first specialist role, the Mining Specialist, and to keep things in line with the Guilty Meme we will name this one the Mournful Miner, and whoever gets this role will have their mining speed increased by 70%, and I might already have one or two suitable candidates in mind. Apart from that, however, nothing else changes, and with that, I think we are ready to confirm our ideology reform. And with that, I think we now also have a few new things to take care of, not only in order to gain more development points, but also to satisfy our new precepts. Just in that moment then, a bold goods trader arrives, so I suppose we will once again be doing some trading soon, as we have also not yet spoken to the shaman merchant either. So let's begin with the bulk goods trader and as you can see this is quite the haul. We're getting rid of some camp fuel, some chocolate and a whole lot of furs and leathers. In exchange we acquire all the nutri amin this trader has for sale and we are also selling off all of those dining chairs we salvaged and instead acquire our very first hospital bed. After all it will be some time until we can actually make them ourselves. And while Kevin is still here, let's have him speak with the shaman merchant immediately afterwards. This time we are not selling anything and only purchase a psychic insanity lance. Yes, it might be expensive, but you never know what it might be good for. In our mountain base, meanwhile, another mining project has begun. With the recent ideology change, our colonists now have a craving for fungus, and so we are now carving out a space to grow it in. And with the Tunnel Lameme, we have also unlocked the unique Fungal Gravel Floor type. It certainly won't win us any beauty contests, but it turns a rocky cave floor into fertile soil, fertile enough at least, so that we can grow fungus on it. We could in theory also grow any other type of crop on it, but in that case we would need an artificial light source, and we are still far away from unlocking sun lamps. And so, as Squix and Brandon put down the new floor type, we have good news from the prison. Kevin has successfully converted our Itakin prisoner, who now too is a believer of Boyo. That means enslavement is up next while our fungal cavern receives its final touches. Again, you can see it here, it's really not nice to look at, but it's supposed to keep us fed and that is all that counts. Once it's finished then we can plop down a growing zone and select Nutrifungus as the crop to grow here. Stats-wise, Nutrifungus is actually very much comparable to potatoes. The unique thing about it is that it does not require any light whatsoever, so it can grow in complete darkness. After a good night's sleep then, I decided to expand the fungus field a bit more on the following morning. If this is indeed going to be our colonists' main food source, then I think we want to go big right from the start here. And so, to cut a long story short, in the afternoon the place is more or less done and we have some visitors, or rather just the one, and even though they have something to trade, it really wasn't anything of interest to us. And so we can now watch as both Wyatt and Kevin begin planting Nutrifungus, while we also take care of a few other smaller projects around the base. Brandon, for example, is currently constructing a poker table with the cloth that we got from dismantling all those sandbags a few episodes ago. And we are also mining out a few more bits and pieces here and there, just so our base is not built around steel and components. Just before bedtime then, we receive another quest and this one actually seems easy to me. Using an Imperial Shuttle, we need to assign six people to carry out an attack on a pirate camp. A camp that is only protected by five pirates itself, and we have faced worse odds for pretty much the entirety of this series, so I suppose we'll give Brandon a bit more honor very soon. First of all though, on the next morning work around the base continues, and then it's time for another Repenser to join our ranks. Our prisoner has officially reached the next step in our program, and so it is now time to give the 16-year-old psychically dull night owl a new name. And as always, chosen from the list of patron supporters, he will now be named Dimitri, after patron Dimitri Greedin. So let's see if the Itakin with a knack for animals and the medical skill will stick around a little longer. With additional passions in construction and plants, he will definitely be useful. The only question is for how long. And while Dimitri gets himself acquainted to life underneath the mountain, we upgrade our hospital a bit. After all, we now have a dedicated hospital bed, so it would be a shame not to use it. Afterwards then, I think it's time that we accept the air assault quest, and I've said it before, we will go for the honor reward with Brandon, which also means that he has to be part of the team, whether he likes it or not. And so, just as a blight hits what little is left of our rice plants, we assemble our squad. This I believe also the premature death sentence for our rice field. With our colonists now preferring fungus anyway, there is no reason to keep this around any longer. With Took entering the shuttle meanwhile, we are ready for takeoff, and just a few moments later we land in the desert surrounding the enemy pirate base. No turrets this time, just five enemies, and they are not too well equipped from what I can tell. Maniac also immediately begins shooting, and so the fight is on right away. 
I have to say though, I am not too worried about this. As you can see, there is a lot of open ground here and not much cover. Our enemies also all have fairly short range weaponry equipped. And so there we are already. Three of them are down and the quest is completed. As advertised, then we will give the honor to Brandon, which then in turn should also unlock his yeoman ceremony, as he has now accumulated enough honor to reach the second royal rank. The pirate base, meanwhile, is quickly scoured for valuables. Obviously, there is not a whole lot here, but we will gladly take a few more lamps and a fire foam popper. After all, everything we grab from our enemies, we won't have to research or manufacture ourselves. And so, with the quest completed, our heroes return back home, just as an Imperial trader also arrives. Unfortunately, we cannot trade with them yet. For that, we would need a pawn at the rank of Knight or Dame. And so, another night passes by, and on the next morning, it is time to finally convert a Maniac. And this time, Kevin is successful, which also means that we are already up to two conversions this episode, resulting in two more ideology development points. Now, at this point, I think we quickly have to talk about the new role of Mining Specialist. The way I see it, there are three suitable candidates for this role. The first one being Squigs, although assigning her this role would have her lose the ability to take care of animals or to construct, and considering she is the best in the colony at both of those, that is absolutely not going to happen. And the same is true for Wyatt, assigning him the Mining Specialist role would have him lose the ability to craft, and that leaves only the recently converted Maniac, who, yes, would lose his cooking skill of 7, but importantly would retain his ability to do research. And so I think, out of all the people we currently have in the Believers of Boyo, he would make for the most suitable candidate. None of the work types he loses here are anything he regularly does anyway. So let us now assign him the role of Mournful Miner. Obviously, though, that role is not limited to just one pawn per colony, so we might see one or two more people join him sooner or later. For now though, the ritual is complete, Maniac now sporting a mining speed of 248%, and who knows, maybe we can even acquire one or two drill arms for him, but for the time being, I'm pretty sure this should suffice. Bad news then from our repenter Dimitri. After just a few days as our slave, he is now rebelling, and well, I guess we are lucky that he only picked up the SMG here, and even luckier that he did not even hit anyone. And so he is quickly brought down and nobody got injured. Well, nobody except for Dimitri, that is. But in his case, he only lost the toe, which now brings up the question, what should we do with him? Obviously, he tried to attack our colonists, so we might have to exile him, just like we did with Tiffy. However, technically speaking, he did not actually hurt anyone. So at least for the remainder of this episode, I'm willing to give him a second chance. But definitely let me know what you think the consequences of this act should be. Do you think we should send him away too, or do you think that losing a toe is enough punishment as it is? In the evening, he does at least get a chance to prove what he can do. Countess Rotona has come down with the plague, but even in the middle of the night, Dimitri is quick on the scene, and a tent quality of 47% is alright, considering the circumstances. Meanwhile, on the following morning, we can watch our team of miners busy at work. We are currently expanding both our kitchen as well as our food storage. With coolers just about to be unlocked, I think we can afford to store a bit more stuff in here soon. Speaking of things that we can store in here, Took has unfortunately once again angered a group of rhinos, but luckily we do manage to skip him out and into safety just in time, and eventually our entire colony assembles for the big hunt. Obviously, three rhinos are no match for us at this stage, but make no mistake about it, without light, Took once again would have gotten mauled, and I'm afraid he won't get lucky every single time. Still, with all animals down, we can continue to focus on base expansion. As you can see, Maniac here clearly mining a little bit faster than his compatriots. Still, all of them are doing great work together, not only expanding our northern access tunnel, but also clearing a building space for potentially a second watermill generator. Late at night then, accompanied by a flash storm, a local chinchilla goes mad. This time we have both Wyatt and Axe out engage it, but our royal guest perhaps a bit clumsy with her plasma sword, getting the kill but also suffering a few small injuries in the process. Once again though, we have Dimitri taking some of the load off of Kevin, which as you can see is a good thing, as it allows Kevin to spend all night researching, and so we now have air conditioning finally unlocked too. That means our next project is then in fact going to be microelectronics, and we can safely ignore the warnings about this unlocking a few things we have no access to because of memes yet, which actually brings me to one of two questions I would like to leave this episode with. 
Now that we have both Guilty and Tunneler as our core memes, what do you think we should go with next? Again, Darkness is not an option for me because we can simply add it via Precept, but I would once again like to fill all four meme slots, so let me know in the comments what you think would fit best. In the early morning of the next day, it is then also time for our already fully healed guest Axouch to leave again. The Royal Shuttle has arrived and we want to send Axouch on her way immediately. After all, it's not like she has been doing any work for us. And so the quest is now completed, which brings me to the second and last question for today. How should we proceed with Brandon's Psycasting abilities? I am very tempted to once again install the Choice of Psycasts mod for him, just because assigning Psycasts simply by the luck of the draw can be very disappointing. In my opinion, at basically every rank there are some that are just miles ahead of the others, but I also don't want to do away with the randomness of them entirely, so let me know how you think we should proceed here. And with that, it looks like we have reached the end of today's episode. Eventually, it ended up even longer than I had expected. And so let's have a look at this week's fan art, with a lovely rendition of Wyatt breaking Maniac out of prison. Lavi Was Taken also explicitly mentioned that they were inspired by Duke Horner's take on Wyatt's armor from the last episode, which I think you can very clearly see. Wyatt, as well as Kevin, are then the central figures in the two artworks that Isaac Young sent in. Both of them were once again accompanied by a bit of backstory that I will leave down below in the comments, as usual. And we also have one more by that one bloke, this one fully animated and voice acted, so I guess I'll just leave that for you to enjoy. You know, I've just about had it with this Xenogene research. As soon as I get close to settling on a vector to affect proxy ribosomes in order to bypass the natural immunity universe. What about virus encoding? Why, in Jinx's name, would I use such a primitive, thousands of years old technique for a project this complex? Well, if it worked for the Terrans, why not us? And with that subtle nod to Maniac's research genius, let's wrap things up for today. As always, I hope you enjoyed the episode, and if you did, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. And if you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can of course go ahead and subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.petecomplete.com, or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.